Okay, number five, successful leaders do action planning. And I think the biggest distinction I've seen here is the folks that are most successful, the most successful leaders, spend time to think. They actually schedule time to think. Schedule time to think about a decision that needs to be made. Right? Schedule time to think and plan, knowing that if they slow down and plan and think strategically, they're going to get to their destination more quickly. They're outcome focused. They know their objective. Not only do they know that vision, but they know the outcome of where they're going, which gives them a lot of clarity and focus of where they're going. So they can focus their efforts. They can execute on this. Many of you have heard the 80-20 rule. There's, it's been used in lots of ways. You know, 20% of your clients give you 80% of the business, for example. This is 20% of your actions give you 80% of your results. 20% of your actions give you 80% of your results. A lot of times we look at our to-do list and we think like everything's equal and I got to get everything done. This is where the rules come in too. What do you think someone's life is like when their rule is I got to complete my to-do list? Yeah, they're probably not happy very often. They're probably pretty stressed. If they think the game is about completing their to-do list, they're going to be, and that's their rules. That's affecting their emotional state, which is affecting their fulfillment in their life, right? All this we're responsible for. Right? What I found is people are, that are the most successful get really good, I like to call this prioritize and calendarize. They get really good at prioritizing the most important things and then getting the most important things into their calendar. And there's plenty of tools out there. Franklin Covey has his ABC method that you can follow on setting priorities and scheduling it. My belief is that there isn't the one right way. The right way is the way that you're going to execute and follow through. And that's what I work with a lot of my clients on is not trying to do it, this is the only way to do it. Take the principles that you know work and then make it your own so you're going to execute on it. And that's the best way for planning, for example. These are the principles, though. There's time to plan, right? Time to think. There's some type of prioritization or focusing on what's, what am I really after. Not all to-dos are created equal. They also know that action creates momentum. You ever find that? You're stuck in some place, but you just take some action, and then it leads to another one, and at least you can build off that and get some more momentum, right? Or quadrant two, how many of you are familiar with Stephen Covey, right? Seven Habits, Highly Effective People. He talks about the different quadrants of things that are important and not important and things that are urgent and not urgent. And quadrant two are the things that are important, but they're not urgent, right? A lot of our time can be spent on reactive mode because we're in the urgency mode all the time. And the reality is in your business, that's the nature. You're going to have to deal with some reactionary mode. But if you spend all your time there, you're not getting to your destination more quickly. Any comments on action planning? Yeah? I was going to say to think is to create. To think is to create. And that, yeah. If you've heard that, I mean, to th it's, everything starts with a thought, right? That's where a vision, new product, new service, everything starts in our mind first. Once we think, then something can be created. This building wasn't here until there was vis visualized first, then they came up with a plan, and then they got into actions. So great point. Any other comments? Great. Action planning results in freedom. When we actually slow down and plan and think strategically, it actually creates more freedom because we know what's most important and we're scheduling the most important things. So go ahead and write down there. Do you schedule time to think and plan? And do you spend some, some of your time in quadrant two on things that are important but not urgent? Just shade that in. <coughs> yes, uh, Mike. Just a, a thought that I've experienced is when you want to take the time to think and plan uh, on a particular strategy or how to resolve something that isn't working right. Yeah. 
I think I have in the past spent too much time to redo what it is that we're doing. Mm. Whereas sometimes I have found success in just knocking on the walls and saying, okay, I want to do this totally different. Mm -hmm. And just stepping outside the box and saying, what's the result? And then working it backwards and found a lot of success in doing that. But you end up scrapping what it is you were doing rather than trying to remake it. So are you saying there's, there's a place and a time for don't overthink something. Sometimes you just need to take action, make a decision, and start moving it forward. Right. And I think that's a great point. Actually, the next point <laughs> is about courage, right? And as an organization and as an individual, sometimes you have to have the courage just to take action and get something moving. And this is where you have to have some uh, you know, sensory acuity on, on when it's the right direction to take it or not. When is it going to serve you to spend time thinking and strategizing? And when is it like, you know what? We really don't need to be thinking about this. We need to be taking a pot, we need to take an action and get this thing moving. Or we may lose this opportunity if we don't take some immediate action on this. So there's a place for that and courage. Great. Thanks, Mike. Anybody else? Yeah. Well, since going back to your your the reasons why a lot of people focus a lot of the time on the how-tos versus if you know let's just do it, the how-to will figure out itself. Yeah. Yeah. If you know exactly what you want and you have a big enough real reason or purpose behind it. People will figure out the how-to. If they're inspired by the vision or the outcome of where you want to go, they'll figure out the how-to. Because chances are in business, there's going to be some obstacles. And that's where the outside of thinking outside of the box comes in, because the how-to will figure out itself outside of the box. Yeah. So you're saying that's where that sparks innovation or creativity. Let's find a different way in order to accomplish this, right? But it's not this way is the only way. It's we know our outcome, and we have a big enough drive to make this happen. The path may go like this, but we're going to move towards it. That's both, was that what both you were saying? Great. Good. Anybody else? Any other comments? You guys can learn a lot in the room here, too. So if anyone has any comments that could be valuable for the rest of the room or firsthand experience around any of this, please, please share. Okay. All right. Number four, successful leaders embrace courage. This is a good example of being here with Peloton, right, showing Lance Armstrong. Anybody watch the Tour de France or follow cycling at all, right? The whole concept of Peloton is that, you're, you, is that you have this protection around you and you can do what you do best. You're going to win the race if you're surrounded by this resource that's supporting you to get to the end game so you can win. And I don't know the exact stat. Maybe you'll know if you follow it, but I believe in the Peloton, you're, it's like 30% less energy you use versus you're out on your own. Is that in the ballpark? Yeah, 30 to 35 percent less energy. And I remember when I first flipped on cycling, um, and I was like, aren't they in a race? Why are they all in a pack together? Why aren't they like taking off and trying to win the race? And then I realized and learned about the concept of the Peloton. It's and even three or four people riding together in a line. Can make all the difference versus alone. Front person's using the so they keep switching off yes because they the person behind can save that energy that much energy and that's what you see in the breakaways in the races right that's a great great concept thank you so embracing courage uh, this is definitely hands down the folks and folks I see in coaching of course are committed to their own development their own professional development people who come to events like this are working on developing themselves there's definitely consistency the folks that are the most successful leaders invest in themselves believe in their own personal and professional development, and they do things to work on themselves. They're continuing to read, learn, attend seminars, listen to CDs, whatever it is, but they're continuing to grow, right? And, they, and where's growth takes place? Yes? Actually, your second point of taking risk, it's uh, smart goals when done properly. The R, there's a nuance, it's really risk. Yeah, I've heard that too. The challenge with setting a smart goal that's reasonable, there's no growth in saying yeah. reasonable. It's, right. Is it risky? Is it achievable? Right. But is it still a risk for a person because they've never... Is it, big, is it a big enough stretch or is it a big enough goal? Right? That's the real subtlety on the smart goal is that yeah. too many people use it as a check the box. I, you know, I'm going to set it as a goal of what I've done before. Right. There's no growth involved. Right. Right. And where's growth take place? Just outside our... Just outside our comfort zone, right? So we got to push ourselves, stretch ourselves in order to achieve that growth. But the folks that are most successful, in my experience, are people that are absolutely committed and they find time. Because by the way, 
Some, a lot of growth stuff falls into that quadrant too, right? It's important, but it's not really urgent. So we could get away with kind of we'll just hang back here in status quo, right? But having a commitment. And they also build a success psychology by challenging themselves. And I could give a whole other program around the, the success psychology, but basically I'm talking about the belief systems that you have that support where you're going, empowering beliefs or disempowering beliefs. Beliefs aren't necessarily true, right? I can believe I'm an incredible father or a lousy father. Neither is true all the time, right? You can believe you're incredible what you do in business or as a boss or not. Neither is true all the time. But which one empowers you to move in the direction you want to you wanna go? So this is back to the meaning failures, right? I work with a lot of people, and there's this fear of failure stuff that comes up because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall. I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to be embarrassed, right? And it keeps them from taking action and moving towards something. But what's the definition of failure, right? The one I like to give now is failure is the quickest way to success. That's a belief. Not necessarily completely true, but it can be empowering if you think about it. And isn't there truth to it? Isn't there truth that the people who failed the most achieve the most? And there's lots of work. Go ahead. Well, and on this one, it's, all, it's easier to be courageous if you have someone with you that's yeah. also living this way. Tell me more when you say living this way. First, people are committed to continuous growth. Yeah. If they have at least one other person that they can energize from who's yeah. choosing to live from a place of courage from taking risks, than always being that one person who's always leading the pack. It goes back to the Peloton. If you've got two people who are trading off, you get a lot farther than if one person's leading the whole way. And He's already on my next point, right? But it's having that success team that you're surrounded with. And I think you also, it's like having an accountability partner. I mean, it ties into a lot of things we're talking about. There's also leveraging each other's strengths. There's, so, but part of what I hear you saying is the, the standard of we're committed to growth and to continue to challenge people. It's like my college roommate. We were going to go work out, and the deal was if you didn't get up to work out, the other person got cold ice water and poured it on you in your bed. That created enough leverage and a partner and accountability to keep a commitment that truly I was committed to, just didn't always feel like it in the moment. Right? So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point. Failure. Um, seek wisdom. I, this was a study, I put that up there, there was a study of uh, folks that turned 100 years old and they just said, you know, would you have done anything differently? And they just added, what do you think they said? No. no. Some of them I think did say no. Take more, risks. take more risks was on the top three. So it was take more risks, learn more, give more. But take more risks was, I, I think it was number one actually, but I, it was definitely in the top three. Right? I wish I would have taken more risks. Usually what got in the way is some definition of what failure I may fail, right? That's but the study based on Paul Yes, failing, who, who's the author? John Maxwell. Yeah, yeah, the leadership expert John Maxwell, falling forward. But that whole premise is based on the belief, and I have not read that book. Yeah, failing, failing forward, sorry, failing forward. And the whole premise is based on the belief, if you're going to fail, fail forward. You're actually benefiting from that, right? So I'm going to learn, even if I don't achieve the exact outcome I set, I'm going to learn something from this experience, which means I'm growing. And if I'm growing, that's success. That's a rule. But wasn't that a more powerful rule that's going to help you to move in the direction you want to move your life in or your business in? Right? Good. Thanks for your, for your sharing. An organizational level, this gets back to what this gentleman was sharing about sometimes you've got to take action. And you've got to have the courage to say, we're going to do this. And at an organizational level, you know, this is where innovation takes place. Right? When you have to get creative, when you have to figure out a path to get there, and you really challenge and say, hey, we've got to stay cutting edge. There is no status quo. The direction technology is going and how industries are changing, we've got we to gotta, we gotta be innovative and continue to grow and learn. They don't settle for good. Right? Good is the enemy of great. Jim Collins, good to great book. Anybody, any other comments on the courage? Yeah. I was just looking at your bill, exercise psychology. I I was told once uh, from a great friend of mine that the most important you'll ever talk to is yourself. The most important person you'll ever talk to is yourself. Yeah. Now, am I the only one that has that little voice that's up here? Right? We all have self-talk. We all have that going on. Right? 
the key to a success psychology is being able to have the ability to say, wait, I can, I can shift my focus. I can focus on a belief that's going to empower me to move me in the direction I want to go. Don't make this wrong, right? You just don't have to believe everything it says, right? Not good enough, you're not going to do this, whatever the story is, right? Everyone has that to a certain extent, right? But we want to focus on empowering beliefs that are going to move us forward. I want to focus on being that incredible father because I know if I believe that, then I'm going to find beliefs. I'm going to find things to support it. And this is how beliefs work, by the way. First, you have the belief. Then you find evidence to support the belief. That's why there's so many passionate arguments in politics and religion, is because people put their glasses on, and they have their beliefs, and then they only see things that support their beliefs. Well, wait, I know it's true, because look at all this proof I have. And the person over here is like, I know it's true. Here's all the proof I have, right? One of the key things about beliefs is most of our beliefs are put into our head before we're even consciously able to choose. Something like 60 to 70 percent of all our beliefs are in us before we're six, which is roughly when we can start choosing what we believe. So that, frankly, it's stacked against us unless we um, start looking, going, do I agree with this? Just because my inner voice is saying it, where'd it come from? And, that, and that's a lot, yeah, it is. And that's one reason I program my girls, and I call them beautiful, and I say pretty girls, pretty girls, pretty girls. They hear that every day, because I know, with women especially, how important that is to a foundation for them, right, to know that they're beautiful. And I've, and I've heard that same stat, that it's before you're six. But you can put a lot of pressure on yourself as a, as a parent, though, too, right? The great thing about it is you can change the beliefs. You can have enough awareness where you can challenge things, and there are strategies. I'm happy to talk to anyone afterwards. There are strategies to shift your belief systems and to align them and, get, be, and create that congruency in the direction and move them in the way you want to go. Did you have something else to add? Okay. That's a whole separate seminar. <laughs> so embracing courage results in growth. Speaking of seminars, Marty, what was the one you have one coming up that you're doing? What do you have coming up? We have a uh, Leaders to Leaders event coming up on May 16th, in which it's uh, strictly business owners, senior executives that get together, share ideas, talk about challenges, um, and share business opportunities. Uh, so mark it on your calendar, May 16th, Cable Center. Uh, you will all be receiving invitations here shortly. Great. Another great opportunity to grow, to learn, to get together, to network with other business owners. So take advantage of that. It's where a lot of growth takes place. All right, so embrace courage. Shade in this area. Do you take risks? Are you committed to continuous growth? How are you finding ways to do it? And by the way, the number one excuse here is I don't have enough time, right? Get some CDs. Put them in your car while you're driving. If you exercise, put them on the iPod so you can listen while you're doing something else. Right? Shift out what you're reading before you go to bed. Some people, you know, what, what if I read this more personal development book versus, and I'm not making it, I'm not knocking anything else. I'm just saying there are ways to incorporate in what you're already doing, ways that you can continue to grow and to learn and to add in some more of that information. Number three, successful leaders. And we've already hit on this one. What was your name? Peter. So Peter's helped bring this one up already, right? It's build that success team, right? Definitely find that successful leaders, back to the strengths, they do what they do best, right? And then they outsource the things that they know they need to outsource so they can do what they do best. They find partners, just as Peter was just sharing. They find mentors. They have coaches. They get together in mastermind groups. They tap into those resources, and it makes them, and it helps them to be more successful. And this is one I had a challenge with. I started my business, and I thought it was hard work, and you got to work hard. And I had this belief, belief we were talking about, kind of like you got to work hard. And I was, it was taught from my father, and it's this being video, Dad, I appreciate it, and hard work's a great. <laughs> and, it, and it's a great, it's, it is, it's, it's, it's a great attribute, but it's not the only one that creates success. And the idea that that belief led to trying and feeling I had to do it on my own was a rule that just simply wasn't true. And that was a shift for my, my business that led to definite breakthroughs when I started to find other partners, right? For the exact reason you said, I've created trainings together. When you partner with somebody else to do it, it's amazing. It creates leverage. It creates synergy. People bring different, uh, different value. So it was, it was very beneficial when you find partners that can leverage what you do. A mentor is someone that's been down the road you want to go down. 
So if you have someone either specifically in your type of business or something you want to do personally, you find somebody who's done that, right? Hey, you want to run a marathon? Find somebody who's run a marathon. How do they train? What are the strategies? What do you eat? How far out did you start training? What do I need to be aware of, right? You get the strategies from a mentor. You can do the same thing on the, on the business. Find a mentor. A coach is someone who has the expertise in closing the gap from where you are to where you want to go to build that success psychology. Tools for overcoming obstacles and resources, but name, maybe not an expert in your industry. Right? A mastermind group is a group of people, and I facilitate these and I, and I have one. It's a group of individuals that share a common outcome that you discuss and support each other's businesses. You share resources. Kind of what Marty was just talking about, the idea that come together and have idea sharing. It's a little more of a structured format that you get together and have X amount of time, but you have specific outcomes. Or each person gets an opportunity to share. So if we took like six of you in here and said, let's talk about, you know, one, let's take Frank's business, and here's one of the biggest challenges he's facing right now. He'd like to get five other business owners, you know, feedback on and resources. You spend about 30 minutes, it's amazing when that many people are focused on one thing, the stuff you can walk out of there with. That's the concept of a mastermind group, and I invite everyone to, to utilize all these types of tools. And succession planning. That's part of a success team that Randy's going to talk about here shortly, right? And I, I've, I've always looked at that. Well, the word success is in succession planning because it's so critical to know who those key players are and what, who, what, what's the talent that we have that's there that we need to make sure that we're grooming to be able to fill in these other positions. How am I going to deal with if I'm no longer here for whatever reason? I won't steal your thunder on that because I like that. <laughs> A success team results in efficiency. So go ahead and mark down here. How strong is your success team? Have you done a good job of getting the key players together? Or is there some ones you're missing? Who do you need to add to your success team? Do you have a succession plan? Not in your head on paper. Any comments on success team? One of the things that gets in the way of this is ego. Yeah, I'm the only one that can do it. And I don't want to find anyone smarter, better, stronger than me in different areas, and yet Carnegie, Ford, Edison, all of them look for people who were stronger than them, smarter <coughs> than them, better than them, both in their strengths and areas of weakness. Yes. And that, so this is a great point, Peter, right? And all of you as leaders, anybody in a leadership role is going to be in that position, and they have that little voice too of not being good enough, or maybe they don't have the resources to bounce things off of because they have to make the decision, right? So they got to take some heat. It's not always easy being on top and being that leader, right? But how do you deal with that if, the, if it's the risk? Because it's probably this little voice that leads to ego that keeps you from saying to bring up those players. So how do you deal with that, Peter? What, what's a strategy for... You know, I know that's the right thing to do, but I have a little uncertainty if I bring someone in that has a different, you know, is it going to make me look bad or are they going to be better than me? A lot of it goes back to emotional intelligence and where a person's coming from. Mm -hmm. Being of service, being comfortable with who they are, mm -hmm. or always worrying about, it's, it goes back to what you were saying, what are your beliefs around the world? Mm -hmm. is, is fundamentally, is the universe a friendly universe or a hostile mm -hmm. universe? Mm -hmm. And anyone who believes it's a hostile universe is always going to be looking out for who's going to stab them in the back, who's going to take over their business, versus believing people truly want to be of service and support each other. Yeah. It's a whole nother. Yeah. That's, well, that whole, that whole belief piece is a whole nother thing. But it, it, it absolutely, that's what affects you. Anybody else have any other comments on that? How do you manage that where it's like, yeah, that stuff gets in the way or the ego gets in the way and keeps from bringing up the right people? Because really, I mean, leadership's about other people are creating other leaders, right? <coughs> yeah, good. It's coming from victim or conflict or mm -hmm. the higher levels of consciousness mm -hmm. of responsibility and above. Yeah, good, so, good, yes. I was gonna say, from truth. Yeah. You know, if you, if you operate at a level of truth, then your ego should not get in the way. Right. So when you're in that truth, when you're in that integrity, then that, that disappears, and you're able to make the quality decisions you need to make. Yeah, and I know John Maxwell was mentioned earlier, I mean, that's, 
when it comes to leadership, I, that's definitely a great resource out there. And he, his, he has another book, is it The Five Levels of Leadership, that I think came out recently that I've started to read, which is, which is great, which talks about some of that stuff in different levels that you may start out here, that a leadership by position, then you move it up to, and you move up to the different levels of consciousness, what, what Peter's talking about. So thank you for sharing. That's great. Good. All right, number two, successful leaders engage in giving. Definitely consistency in the folks that I've worked with and that they all have an element where they're giving and they're trying to make a difference and it's more about the impact, right, or success. It's more about significance and the impact that they can have, right? And they give, not just financially necessarily, but give of their time, their money, their resources, and they just have that belief system. They focus outside themselves. Right? This is an example of what I do even when I speak or train sometimes is the mantra I have is I'm not here to impress, I'm here to influence. Right? Because that little voice may say, well, wait, you're impre- you you got to impress or do you have something in your hair? What are they looking at? Or whatever the story could come in right? when you're in front of a room right? and say, well, that's not what this is about. Right? Even if that little voice shows up, it's remembering, no, it's about being present. It's about influence and it's about the impact that I'm committed to having. Right? Any great salesperson. If they're all up here talking about, I got to say the, I got to say the right terminology so I can close the sale, right? Versus saying I'm committed to have an impact, and I believe this product or service is going to have the impact, and they're congruent because you can feel congruency, right? We know when you're with someone who's in any sales role, when there's congruency, you can tell that they're congruent and they mean what they're saying, and and, it, and it's truthful, and they're not trying, they don't have another story where they're trying to close the sale. Nothing's wrong with sales, right? But sometimes the terminology for some people creates a story in a belief system because people have beliefs, exactly what Peter was sharing. People have beliefs around sales. Sales means success. Well said, right? But some other people have some other definitions and it keeps them from moving forward. Understanding our belief in giver's gain. That's a belief too. Giver's gain is simply the belief that I believe if I give and support enough other people that it will come back around and support me, right? That's just a belief. Understand reciprocity. Reciprocity is a tool for influence, and it's just that this is part of our psychology, but with people, if you give and support someone, there's natural some reciprocity that kicks in that they want to give and support you. Wealthiest people have in common. um, Well, what I was thinking about with this was uh, many of you may be familiar, but Bill Gates and Warren Buffett got together, and they have this billionaire club, basically, and they're giving all billionaires that got at least 40 that I remember, it might be more than that now, that committed to giving a billion dollars to charity, and they're creating this, this group of people and getting commitments of a lot of, uh, I think it's mainly in the U.S., but they're trying to expand it, too. <coughs> how to get, Zig Ziglar, how to get everything you want in life is help enough other people get what they want. Isn't there a truth to that? At an organizational level, with this principle, it's how do we add more value? You know, I think a Peloton, just this example, right? And Kip, who's sponsoring today as well, right? It's like, this is something that provides more value. This isn't on here. This doesn't say leadership development, provide opportunities for network and education. But they made a decision to say, hey, we're going to do something that we can add more value to our clients. It's what we all need to be asking. How are we adding more value? How are we going to have big, more impact? with our clients. Actually, BJ, I see back there, I remember taking my car. BJ uh, Penrod has um, auto theft and collision business. I took my car in there because there was a, a dent. I won't go into the details, and I won't say that it was my wife, but it was. But, <laughs> but um, I go to pick up my car, and it's like cleaner than it's ever been. I mean, like, how cool is that? Like, not only do you get the, the dent out, but the car, it, you get the car back. I mean, that is like That's adding extra value that was unexpected. And I think all of us in business have to look for things like that. What are we doing to add more value? Giving results in receiving. So how about you in this area? How much? There's a great book yeah. called Giver's Gain by Bob Berg. Yes. He wrote Endless Referrals. It's a yes. quick read and it's a great one. Yes. yes. So, Giver's Gain, Bob Berg. Great. Yeah. Another great, great resource. You know, we get what we focus on and we create more where we add value. This reminds me of an example. I did work with the local chamber that was having a lot of challenges. 10 of the 16 board members 
left, membership was declining, they had tens of thousands of dollars in debt, and the focus was all on the debt and who are we going to pay next, right? And then what we did through a really a strategic planning process was, was shifted to how do we add more value to our membership. Sounds like a basic concept and really what any association needs to be asking or organization. But simply in doing that, and there was more to this process, but the idea was basically the premise of how do we add more value. Then the conversation shifted to adding value to membership, which led to providing a program that we created where we brought in speakers, which led to some other value-added networking opportunities and things that we did. And we found when we did that, it shifted the focus and the energy, and what happened is it led to increase in membership. In fact, membership increased the next five years, and this is in the last five years that most associations have gone the other way, right, because of the economy. I'm not making excuses. We didn't have excuses. We found out, right? So that's just simply by saying how do we add more value. So that can definitely happen at an organizational level. Uh, number one, successful leaders show appreciation. You know, we're in a, when we're in a place of gratitude, we don't experience any fear, right? Some folks have habits around this. Gratitude habits, gratitude journal, three things that you're grateful for before you go to sleep. Some people, it's meditation or prayer, but something that helps reconnect to being grateful and to being present. You ever had that feeling like you're at work thinking about your personal life and then you're at home thinking about your work life? You're like, can't I just be doing what I'm doing? Right? It takes a muscle to build that, to be able to be present. Have perspective. The example I'd like to share here, how many of you, have you heard of the Tennyson Center? It's a local child, child abuse, yeah. So it's um, abuse children, and it's a, a local organization, charity organization that supports kids. And as part of the National Speakers Association, some of my colleagues are, um, we put on a speech, a speech contest for these kids. These are like nine to 13 year old abuse kids and they get an opportunity to put a, you know, like five minute, three to five minute speech together and they give that speech and we're able to give them feedback and help them develop and obviously it's about building their confidence, right? And this little girl, this is just, just happened a couple months ago, she was 13 and she had been in 11 different foster homes. And she got up there and started sharing, well she shared this analogy that She's like, think about you're in this car and you're driving down this dirt road and the window's down and the wind's blowing in your hair and you know, really did a great job of the descriptive of taking us in that place. It says, and you, and you look through the rearview mirror and you're seeing you know, the past of your life. And she said, I choose to look out the windshield and focus on my future where I'm going. And there wasn't a dry eye in there when she shared this story to hear her use these words. And it just put things in perspective. Right? And we think about we have problems. Right? The other um, stat I heard was if the world population was 1,000 people, 500 go to bed hungry, 600 don't have running water, 700 of those people have, are illiterate beyond a first grade in, in, uh, education. And if you make over $30,000 a year, you're in the top one-tenth of 1% 1 in the world. But it's things like that that puts things in perspective. And folks that are successful leaders have the ability to remember that and to put things in perspective and to be grateful and to appreciate. At an organizational level, it's about celebrating successes. One strategy I use both with individuals and organizations is always ask this question, what is great? Right? What is great? This is part of that process I shared with the chamber. It was asking, what is great? What do you have to build on? What was, let's share about the success in the past. I know it's been awful for the last you know, couple years, but what about before that, when this chamber got built? And we reconnected to what made the chamber great. And that became some of the things that we added value, back to what we were talking about earlier. Because what you focus on grows. Any meeting, always, anytime I'm leading a meeting, I'm like, what's great? What's great that we have to celebrate that's working? Not just, be, one, it helps people feel good. But it brings up the energy level, and that high energy level is going to make people more productive on whatever else is on the agenda. And number two, if you know what's working, you want to repeat what's working, right? If you know what's great and working, hey, should we do more of that? If that's working, maybe that's something you do more of. What's great? Do you have something to add, Peter? Uh, when you made that comment about the association, I just one of my professors had a saying I love, that which is currently taking place is not impossible. 
That which is currently taking place is not impossible. So it's happening anywhere in the world. If right. someone's doing what you want to do or what you're right. attempting to. It's already happening, so there's proof. That's a belief too, right? It's a belief. It's happening somewhere else, so why can't it be happening here is basically what's, what's the challenge is there, which is great. Because so many people say, well, it's impossible. That's them. That's not right. us. Right. We're special. We're unique. Right. So that people Story and excuse. Negative mindset <laughs> will always give excuses why it can happen out there, but Good. not here. Good. Good. Well said. Showing appreciation results in happiness. When we're able to be grateful and appreciate what we have, brings more happiness. So go ahead and fill in this last area. Do you express appreciation? Do you have an attitude of gratitude or able to reconnect to what you're grateful for? Once again, leadership's a journey. This isn't about being a five in all these areas. This is an area to look at that, what you've kind of put down on paper there, and start to look and say, hey, what are some of the strengths of things I want to continue? And what are the areas that there's an opportunity to improve here? Or there's an opportunity where I can really grow. This is my development opportunity. What I want to invite you to do then is I'm going to have you just talk with a partner, the person next to you, and just kind of share. We're going to focus on this one. You know, what, what is it, what's kind of, what did you kind of take from the conversation that we've talked about, and what's the one area that, that you want to focus on that's going to have the biggest immediate impact on your success as a leader? So let me give you a few minutes to do this. So go, so go ahead and uh, just talk with a partner. Okay. Uh, so let's just have a few people share. What, what's, what's, what's your biggest takeaway that you're taking from this? Or you could share the specific area that you're focused on that's going to have the immediate impact to improve your success as a leader. Let's just have a few people to share, and then we'll wrap up. I think a couple of things that we talked about is striving to have the proper balance. Hmm. You know, the proper balance in your personal life and your business life, and how you integrate the two so that it becomes an even balance for both. Yeah. It seems like sometimes you, when you're on vacation, the first one takes over. The rest of the time, the business takes over what you have to get done. Yeah. So striving to find that proper balance. And the other thing, more so what I have found, is in order to accomplish a lot of these things and be highly successful at it, you have to have the right personalities on your team. Yeah. If you don't have that, it's a real struggle. So finding people who have a passion for these things is really, really critical. Yeah. And in today's kind of hard to find that. Mm -hmm. really yeah. So, so finding, the right, finding the right people, getting the right people on the, time, uh, on the team, or making a change if you need to make a change. And then the balance. So is there anything we talked about today specifically that, that you feel would help you around that balance piece? I think we all can relate to that, right? Vacation, then I'm focused on my personal life, but the rest of the time I'm focused on that. Anything that we talked about that resonated for you that would help you in that area? Uh, probably a little bit more aggressive on the courage side, okay. a little bit more aggressive on action plans. Okay. I'm a great believer in action plans, but sometimes I allow other influences to kind of create little barriers and roadblocks. Okay, got it. So having the courage when those roadblocks set up that I'm going to continue to act and move it forward. Good. Great. Well said. Well said. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. So balance is always the biggie, but the other thing is there's, there's that old saying about when, you, when you're so busy knocking the alligators off the boat, it's hard to remember that your objective was to drain the swamp. <laughs> and I think that's a challenge we all have, is we have to keep remembering that our objective is to drain the swamp. Right. Figure out a way to keep the alligators at bay, but drain the swamp. So we talked about the principle of focusing on the outcome and not being distracted by the reactionary of the challenge, and that's basically what you're sharing. Any other strategies that you took from what we talked about today or that you have from your own experience of how to do that? How do you keep your focus on draining the swamp? Well, partly it comes from balance, partly it comes from vision, and partly it, it comes from, from the ability to step back and slow down to speed up. Yeah. And that's not something that I'm always very adept at, but it's something that I need to be reminded of. Right. So it might be scheduling that time to think that we talked about. All right, one more. One more person want to share their biggest takeaway from today. Yeah, right here. I'll just uh, share real quick. So I just looked through the uh, wheel here. I just, you know, number them uh, according to what I see. So, like, number one is to take more courage to have more responsibility, to create the real reason, to have an action plan, to create strengths within the team, to have balance. All, all of those. Just... You know, if you just 
go down and segment out, that's how I would number it. Yeah, and, and all those, obviously a lot of these feed each other and they're connected in a lot of ways, right? I would just invite you to say, hey, here's where I'm gonna start, right? This is the area I'm gonna focus and let me build around this one and then you continue to add. But great, well, thank you. I appreciate all your time today. I hope that you took some great value or at least some things that you can immediately apply. Um, once again, if you just fill out those feedback forms and I'll exchange the extra handout for that. And now I'll bring up or re-invite up Randy for the succession planning presentation. Great, thanks for having me. Good, you're welcome. Thank you.